Well, good morning. Thank you for making time to come to this parenting conference. You have given me a precious gift, a Saturday, and I know that Saturdays are precious for everyone, so thank you so much for being willing to be here. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, married, been married for 23 years. We have five kids. They range in age from 18 to 8, which means I've had plenty of time and plenty of opportunities to make all the mistakes. Um, you would think that somebody who has a counseling degree, a marriage and family degree, and then also a divinity degree, and I'm currently working on a PhD in counseling, that maybe I would have the answers and I would make less mistakes, and you are wrong. So uh, you can learn from me, and hopefully I'll be able to bring something uh, that you'll be able to learn from today. Speaking of which, let me give you a quick kind of outline for what we're going to be doing Three sessions, really. The first one is really going to be about what is truth. In this current day and age, we need to be able to talk about truth and give our kids some truth. I know that sounds very philosophical. And when I was in most of you guys' age and stage as far as kids, my sense is most, most of you guys have, you know, newborns, three, five, seven, eight in that range. It was all practical. I just wanted practical tips. Help me to survive and not kill my kids and show something of the love of Christ. And so we will have plenty of that, don't worry. But that will probably be more session two. So session one is going to be a truth, and how do we communicate that truth, and what does that truth mean uh, as we try to communicate it to our children? Why does it matter? Secondly, very practical tools. Our second session is very practical tools, thinking about how we communicate the truth to our children based on who the Lord has made them to be. Oftentimes, one of the mistakes that we make as parents is that just because one way we communicate truth resonates with one of our children, we then just copy-paste to the rest of our children. But God makes them in very different ways, and so you need to have a paradigm for trying to understand how has God made this particular child that I may communicate this truth as effectively as possible. And then the third one, we're going to look at our current modern-day issue, which is typically sex and sexuality. Like there's, if you want to look at where does truth come into contact with the world right now, it's on issues of gender and sexuality. So we're actually going to look at one of the world's lies that they're constantly communicating to our children and how the truth of Christianity comes into contact with that and then helps our children as they move forward at their various ages and stages through life. So that's our kind of our broad outline for this morning. Well, why talk about truth in parenting? This is uh, something that can seem super philosophical. I'm doing a PhD, and one of the topics in my PhD area is genuineness or authenticity, and that gets you down the route of truth. Uh, and there's all kinds of books, very boring books that make you want to go to sleep books. Uh, but there's all kinds of books about truth, and it can seem very esoteric, very away from what you and I feel like we need, especially if you were anything like me at this stage where you just feel exhausted and you're just trying to hold on for tools for how to parent well. Um, but I would tell you that truth is needed more now than ever before for your children. I was lucky enough to have dinner with some of your staff last night, and we were just talking about the terrible devastation of Hurricane Helene, and I made the statement that it seems like the news just isn't covering what is going on there like it would if it were, say, northeast or west coast or something like that, and someone made the comment, yeah, is it because nobody watches the news anymore? And the answer is, I, I think that's true, and I think it's because we all now have a sense where we don't even know where to get truth anymore. Uh, I remember a day and age, my wife and I, when we first got married, I'm old enough that we had a, 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 a TV in the bedroom, one of those massive TVs, you know, uh, tube TVs in our bedroom, and you would keep it on while you were getting ready in the morning because you would hear things like the traffic report 
and and the weather so you would make sure that you know and if you needed an umbrella or a raincoat or whatever right it gave you information and then sprinkled out throughout that information there would be news reports what's going on locally and nationally and one time there was a bit of a traffic jam i i was we were in memphis at the time that's where i grew up there was a bit of a traffic jam out in the suburbs of memphis because some random emu came through the suburbs of Memphis. And so there's a reporter literally in this like country area. There's nothing around them. There's just this road. Traffic is flowing fine by then, right? And there's this reporter who's like, and this is where the emu was, right here. I've talked to some people and they said, we didn't expect an emu. And that was, that was it. That was, that was the totality of the reporting. And my wife and I, from that point forward, it was so inane, we would always make fun. And that's where the emu was. But if you had that same report today, it would depend on which news source that you were listening to. If your news source tended to lean progressive, there would undoubtedly be this and it's just another sign of the doom that is the climate crisis. And if your news pointed right, it would be, and the border is so porous we can't even keep out the emus. <laughs> right? It, it doesn't matter. that You're going to editorialize the end of any report that you get nowadays. You and I are old enough to remember what objective reporting looks like, and it concerns us that we don't really have a sense about where you go anymore for truth. Well, if that's true for you and I, it is doubly true for your kids, especially as they get up to the age where they really need to know where to go for the truth, typically adolescents and early adults. Right now, they can come to you and you can tell them that there's a fat man in a red suit that gets pulled around in the sky by reindeer and he makes his way all the way around the world and they go, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> makes sense, right? But at some point, they're going to get to the place where they're like, I'm not sure about that. And I need to know where it is that I get truth. Now, now I'm fine if you have Santa as a part of you. I'm not anti-Santa. Don't get that. But, but they need to know so at some point where is it beyond mom and dad that I find truth? And so that's why I think it's important for you and I to talk about this, especially uh, this morning. Secondly, Scripture itself is very interested in truth. Proverbs 23, 22, and 23. Listen to your father. Notice the parenting language here. That's what Proverbs, the wisdom book, when it wants to communicate wisdom, often does it in terms of parent to child. Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. And then maybe one of the most interesting of the scriptures on truth is Christ himself. In John 14, in that farewell discourse with the apostles, it's his last moment with the apostles. This is an amazing setting. If you haven't read the farewell discourse, John 13 through 17 recently, do your soul a favor, go back and reread it. It is beautiful. It is the most intimate setting you have with Christ and with his disciples. And he's trying to communicate a number of things, kind of underline, highlight, emphasize. And one of the things that he says in that moment is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, what's interesting about that is that Christ isn't saying he's the information. That's not what the truth is. Truth is no less than that. It's no less than the correct information. But it's more than that. It is relational transformation. Truth always transforms. Let me give you an example. You may or may not know that the 
force of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. Doesn't matter. You live your life like it. There are reasons why you don't jump off of tall buildings. There are reasons why you watch your speed. There are reasons why when other people are speeding around you, it causes concern. Because that's a truth, and that truth molds your entire life. How you interact with all the things around you. And so the truth of the gospel, the truth of who Jesus is, that he is both God and man, that he should choose to take on humanity when he didn't need to. He stood in need of nothing. He didn't need worshipers. He didn't need glory. He needed nothing. He was perfect in fellowship with Father and Spirit and chooses to bring on humanity a limitedness to his infiniteness for one reason, that he might suffer, that you might be saved. That truth should radically reorient our lives. Our kids should notice the relational difference in us because that's true. And so that's what I want us to think through really um, this day is how that particular truth plays itself in our lives. The world tries to play at what truth is. It can't really get to what truth is because it doesn't know the truth giver. All truth reflects something of the nature and character of the grand creator himself. This is why science never scares me. Bad science does, but real science doesn't. All it can do is reflect something of the logical nature and caring nature of the one who created all things. But the world will try to say, okay, we've got to rescue, rescue truth away from something what we would call pre-modern. By the way, I hate that term, pre-modern. I mean, it makes me sound like I drag a club around and I go at night to a cave, right? I, I would prefer much more something like supernatural, natural, and unnatural instead of pre-modern, modern, and post-modern. Because supernatural says there is a natural world, but there's also something above the natural world. A natural philosophy says this natural world is the only thing that exists. And an unnatural world says you can't rely on anything around you. You can only look inside for how you feel. Well, that, that modern or naturalistic philosophy says truth is only found in a lab. It's only something that you can test over and over and over again. And it's non-falsifiable. Okay? That, that, that is the basis of the scientific method. Except that it's impossible for that to be true. Right? Why is it impossible for that to be true? Because it can't carry its own weight. Can you test that all knowledge is knowledge that has to be non-falsifiable in a lab, in a lab? No, it's a philosophical statement. It's like having a rocket on the launch pad and it blowing up before it even gets off the ground and still being able to say, well, that was a rousing success. No, it can't carry itself. And, and there are entire mathematical models. We won't go there. I, I mentioned one, uh, Goidel's incompleteness theorem or whatever it is that will actually show that there are truths that can't be proved okay which is what pushes then people to go okay well mm, if science and kind of the naturalism of science can't be the thing that tells us what is true then where do we go from here well then the only thing that can tell you what is true is inside you it's this internal thing. That's what tells you what is true. But it can't tell you what is true because my internal voice is different than your internal voice. 
What you want and say is true about a particular situation is different than what I think. You and I may agree 99.9% .9 of the time, and there's still a one-tenth of 1% where one of us is in error. But a postmodern kind of worldview doesn't leave any room for that. Your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth. Well, my truth is, is that, you know, I want that parking spot, and your truth is, is you're not leaving. Well, what does that mean? Right? Our truths come into conflict with each other. So, uh, this is not new. Right? Just think again, back to Pontius Pilate, John 18. Uh, Pilate has asked Christ if he's a king. And he says that I've come for this purpose. To bring the truth. And what does Pilate say in return? What is truth? This isn't new. These sort of language and word games that we can play in order to get around the things that we don't like. And ultimately, that's why the world really doesn't like the truth as Christians know the truth to be because it makes demands on your life about what is right and what is wrong, as we'll see in just a moment. So there's one foundational truth that... I want us to think through that we're trying to communicate to our kids in our own lives. That, that's what this session is. How does this truth live itself out as I parent my children? The foundational truth. God's word tells us that we are image bearers, born in sin and saved by grace, unto good works there are five component parts to that one truth authority god's word value image bearer problem born in sin solution saved by grace purpose unto good works that one truth acts as a sort of road map to help you to be able to communicate to your kids what you believe and why the gospel makes a tangible difference in your life. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about each one of those component parts and how it is that each and every one of those component parts makes a difference. So let's start with the first one. God's word tells us. This is an issue of authority. Where do you and I turn when it's time to find out how the world is made, what is right and what is wrong? Is it to our internal voice or is it to the voice of the creator? Is it God's word? Uh, every single uh, uh, person needs to know how they're made and what they're made for. Every person needs an authority figure in their life, something to which they can turn, something to which they must submit. Okay, let me pause here for a second. Um, if we live our lives with the Invictus model, I am the master and commander of my soul. I submit to no person, then we cannot be surprised when our children do not submit to us or to God's word. That, that's part of what this is. If you're a part of this church, there's a submission, I assume in your membership. Yeah? Okay. So when you take membership vows, you submit to the authority of the church. Same thing happens for us good Presbyterians that we are. You know, there's always some questions there. And one of them is about, do you see yourself as a sinner without hope in the sight of God? Do you see Jesus as the only hope? And then one of them is, do you submit to the government of this church? You are choosing to submit to a group of people who themselves should be submitting to Christ and to his reign and to his word. Authority figures... When, when it's done well, 
and authority, uh, um, uh, places of authority, help us to understand how it is that they're made and for what we're made. It, it's kind of like having an owner's manual to your soul. Uh, my son one time got one of those, uh, you know, I had when I was a kid, those Casio watches, really cheap Casio watches that has 17 buttons all around the crown and on top of the crown. And like, it can tell you the date, it can tell you the time, it can tell you the time on Saturn, it can track the difference between the time on Saturn and Neptune and Earth and who knows all the functions that this thing has. More functions than you ever need. You just, just give me the time, that's all I need, right? And so my son, of course he gets it, it's like, you know, one of his uncles gives him this incredible cool watch. And he wants to know how to do all the things. How do I lap time, right? How do I use the stopwatch feature? How do I, I, I have no idea. I, I don't intuitively have the Casio owner's manual in my heart, right? I wasn't given that. And so I've got to go and find the owner's manual online and read it and like, okay, press these two buttons at the same time and hop three times and whatever it was, <laughs> the magic combination to get the stopwatch and the lap watch and the Neptune time and the, all the things that it did, right? I needed a manual in order to teach me how to use the functions of this watch. That's what God's word does. It acts as a manual to tell you what it is that your soul needs. And the designer of your soul tells you that you need a few things. One, you need genuine fellowship with God. What does that mean? Have, have you ever struggled with that? What does it mean to have a genuine relationship with the Lord? I mean, sometimes it just feels like I'm, I'm going through the motions, but I don't feel that connectedness. Well, let me tell you, it means primarily doing two things. Uh, my entire dissertation is on intimacy and the process of intimacy. So I would tell you that the, the kind of definition of felt intimacy is deep and abiding connection. And the process to get there is genuinely known and received by another. And the way that you and I experience genuinely being known is prayer and God's people as they know us. And so it's being able to offer up to the Lord where we are genuinely. That means being able to allow our kids to see us offering up our prayers genuinely unto the Lord. More and more our prayers look like our Instagram feeds. They have to be clean. They have to be nice looking, inviting. Have you read the Psalms lately? That's not what the Psalms look like. Have you read Psalm 88 lately? Psalm 88 is one of the darkest Psalms. In fact, it is the darkest Psalm in the Psalter. The only light in Psalm 88 is, O oh God of my salvation. But then everything else is terrible. You've made darkness my only friend that's how it ends now i gotta be honest if i'm god and praise the lord that i am not but if i'm god and someone said hey god i wrote a little ditty about you and to hear it go you took everything from me you've made everything darkness the end i'd probably say hey maybe we need to do a little bit of a rewrite Right? Don't, don't forget about the whole like leading you out of Egypt thing, giving you a land. Psst, my son's coming. And he's going to die for you all in order that you might be ransomed. And instead, God says, nope, that's about me. Believers feel that way. Put it in my book. So prayer, genuine prayer, our sadness, our hurts, our fears, even our boredoms are perfectly acceptable to the Lord. And our kids, in appropriate ways, need to be able to see us 
engaging in prayer. The way we know God, he knows us through prayer, we know through him how by his word. Right, that's how the conversation with God works. He listens to us as we pray to him. We listen to him as we read his word. And the more my prayer is scriptural shaped, scripturally informed, the more we're talking the same language. If you ever struggle with your prayer life, I would recommend starting with one of the books of the Psalms. There are five books. Just start with one. Start with that first psalm in that book, take the first stanza of that psalm, read it, and try to just give whatever the main point of that stanza is back to the Lord in your own words. And when you've done that, move to the next stanza. And watch how your prayer life will blossom. So our kids need to see that our souls were meant for genuine fellowship, with the Lord. That happens as we pray, as we read God's word, and as we worship together as a people. There's an intimacy that happens when we worship together. I don't know about you, but Sundays seem to be, can I say this as a pastor? They seem to be the worst sometimes. Like my kids are fine on Saturday. Everybody's good relatively good mood they wake up sometimes early on their own on saturday but sunday comes everybody's mad everyone's tired they don't want to get dressed they don't want to go to to church they fight and say some of the most terrible things to each other in the back of the van where i can't reach them right and you just pull up to the parking lot and you're like, Lord, help. I've got a one word prayer and it's help. That's it, right? Satan hates worship. He hates it. He wants to isolate you and get you on your own because he can do the most damage that way. When you're in communion and fellowship, and worship with a group of people, all of a sudden there's an element of spiritual resiliency that you have. Spiritual warfare is real. Look, I'm not charismatic. I'm before. But Sunday morning, man, sometimes, and I don't think that I've ever seen or had to battle Satan himself. Satan, Satan is localized. He's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient because he's not God. But his interns are really effective sometimes. And he sends those interns, it seems like, in full force on Sunday morning. And so our kids need to see us even when we struggle to have genuine fellowship, struggling to get up and to go in order that we might have fellowship. Secondly, our soul's designed for God's glory. Some of you know the Westminster Shorter Catechism and question and answer number one. It tells us that we're designed for this very purpose, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Right? And there's something that when our souls glory in God and reflect His character back, that it's deeply satisfying even when it's deeply difficult. But just like the owner's manual tells me that the watch, going back to the watch for a second, it can only be submerged in this deep a water. I don't know. Five meters. But I'm American, so I have to go and look what meters means in feet. I don't know. So it can only go this many meters, and then you'll break it. Well, Scripture tells you the limits of your soul. What is it that tends to bend and break your soul? And that's sin. And so again, our children need to see us really battling against this. Not always giving into it. Knowing what Christ's character is and what his demands are on our lives. Okay. Let's move on to the second truth. And that is we are image bearers. 
So God's word tells us that we are image bearers. A number of issues here. First off, all humanity is created with value. Let me say this again. All humanity is created with inherent value. No other thing in all creation, not even the angels, are created after the image of God. Do you know what an idol is? An idol is something that's supposed to represent a god. It's a a little carved thing. And one of the reasons why the Lord gets so angry when we have idols in our hearts or when the Israelites would actually worship these pieces of wood is that you and I are the idols. We are made in his image and given things like, again, authority over creation in his stead. And that's true for every single human that's made. They have that level of value. Okay, what does that mean? Brothers and sisters, it means we have to watch our tongues and we have to watch how we talk about people. You're gonna be coworkers, neighbors, everyone has one, family member, crazy Uncle Larry or whoever it is. The those, the them, who is your them? People on the opposite side of the political aisle? Is that the them? Right? Now, you don't have to agree with them. I'm certainly not telling you to do that. But we do have to treat them as if they are valuable people. That's really going to inform part of our response later when we have to think about How do we engage with a world that's telling a whole bunch of kids that their gender is fluid and that they can change on a whim? And it's easy for you and I to recoil and protect. Okay. But there's also a sense of trying to show value. Value to people who do not think, act, or look like us. D.A. Carson, in his book, Loving in Hard Places, Uh, said, and this convicts me, if you've ever been to First Columbia, uh, and I invite you to come to First Columbia, if you're ever in Columbia, why would you go to Columbia, South Carolina? But if you ever happen to go there, you are banished from this beautiful place, and you have to go to Columbia, come visit us. We would love to have you worship. But we all look about the same. right? And so D.A. Carson wrote in his book, that ideally when someone walks in the door of God's to, to see God's worshiping people, they should have the thought that the only thing that could keep this group of people together is the truth of a real God they worship. No political ideology, no social ideology, no economic ideology. It's the fact that they all worship the same God. There's a beauty there. And so everyone deserves a a measure of our care and consideration. Uh, This is also why we hold life to, whenever life begins, whenever X and Y come together and create um, a diploid pair, I know it's very technical, Uh, my wife and I, we have five children, all five children are a result of one IVF process. We had five years of infertility, IUIs that failed, an IVF that absolutely failed, and then an IVF that set the clinic record for the most live births. And the Lord was so kind. Five years of infertility, five children. One child for each year. It's just beautiful what he did in our lives. More than we could ever think or hope or imagine. And if you had told me that I was going to be a dad of five kids when I was just newly married, I would have told you, you're crazy because I only wanted one or two. But he knows what he's doing, and they've been wonderful. However, we said that the moment X and Y come together, diploid pair, we give it the right of life. Because all humanity is made in the image of God. Not every one of those embryos ends up coming to be an actual live birth, but all of them deserve our respect. It's what animates 
our decision to be pro-life, not just because of some political choice, but because of this reality that we are created with inherent value. Now, what that means for you as a parent is you need to be able to communicate to your kids that their value is based in who they were created to be, not in their beauty, not in how well they do at school, not in their extracurriculars, not in their social group, not in their popularity, right? That's really hard for us. It is. Let, let's just all be honest. I, I have never seen more joy from dads than when their kid hits the winning basketball shot, scores the winning run, jukes somebody on the football field, right? I mean, you see grins bigger than their faces sometimes. Okay, which is great. It's great. I'm not telling you not to do that. Dads, be very proud of your kids, especially when they excel. But if the only time they see that smile on you is when they hit the winning shot, when they come home with the A, when you find out that they've become the homecoming queen or the homecoming king, and all the rest of the time you're just mildly irritated with them, where do you think they think their value lays? It's not in who they were created to be. It's how they can perform, right? Again, I want high performers. I encourage high performers in my own children. They're all AP and honors kids, and they are amazing because they get it all from their mom. But they're amazing. And we, we, we want them to do that. However, they know without a doubt, my love for them does not hinge on their performance. Heaven per forbid something should happen to them physically and they could not do any of those things, couldn't even live on their own. My value of them would not change. My value stays the same because it's not about me and it's not about them. It's about the value that the Lord gives them. Okay, we're starting to run short on time, so I'm going to go ahead and switch to our next truth that we are born in sin. So, uh, this particular truth, we see it in the shorter catechism and larger catechism. I know some people are more familiar maybe with the Westminster. Just quick show of hands, when I say the Westminster, like confession of faith, larger and shorter catechism, how many are familiar with what I'm talking about? Okay, so there are some that are not. Um, the Westminster Confession is just a system of documents, questions, and answers. The confession itself is arranged by chapters that tries to communicate the scriptural truth. That's all it's doing. It's taking the scriptures. When we think about God, who God is, what are his attributes, let's take all the scriptures that speak to that and then let's think through it in a systematic way. That's chapter 2 of the confession. The larger and shorter catechism, the shorter catechism was originally developed to be the children's catechism. I had to learn the shorter catechism to graduate with my master's degree. But back in that day, that's what you taught kids. That's incredible to me. The larger catechism is a more in-depth question and answer document. The beauty of that, if you've never read the shorter catechism or the larger catechism, there are so many questions that you have that brilliant men have thought through and have gone to Scripture to try and answer. Almost all of your questions theologically can be answered in that document. So if you haven't read it, you know, take one question a day, one question a week, it doesn't matter. Start flipping through. You'd be amazed at what you find in there. Okay, so off of the, off of the history there for a second, um, there's a question that asks whether or not anyone is able to keep the law perfectly. right? Because that's what righteousness requires. Is that you would have to keep the law perfectly your whole life in order to be able to get to heaven. And so the question is, can any mere man, hint, not Christ, keep the law perfectly? And their answer is, 
no man of normal generation, not supernaturally generated, uh, can keep the law perfectly, but does sin or doth sin in thought and word and deed. How often? Daily. And they don't mean just once a day. What they're trying to say is a day doesn't go by that you don't sin. And the more often you think about sin and Christ and his righteousness, the more you realize that you're a sinner. There's this great um, illustration from the late 19th century by a guy last name of Hodge. Uh, he, he would talk about a woodshed. And he had this woodshed, and of course this is pre-electrical outlet in the shed, um, and you'd go in the shed, and the door would close behind you, and all of a sudden, it would be dark. Just total darkness. Except for this one shaft of light that came in from outside because the roof had a hole in it. He said, it's like when you get close to God's Word and His holiness. It's like getting closer to that light. And every time you get closer to the light, the more you realize, oh, there's, there's something on me. I'm, I'm dirty, right? You kind of just, you know, all right, okay, I look okay. And you get closer to the light and you realize, oh, actually I'm much dirtier than I thought I was. Let me go ahead and try and clean myself. Okay, I'm good. And then you get closer and uh, I am filthy. Every time you get closer to Christ, his word and his character, the more you realize you sin. That should not be a discouragement to you. It should not be an excuse, but it should not be a discouragement. Right? Why is this important? A couple of reasons. One, we can be honest about our failures as parents. We don't have to try and be perfect. And more than that, we have to make sure we don't communicate ourselves as being perfect. There's a, there's a trap that your heart and pride get into, that's like, if I don't communicate that I'm perfect to my children, all of a sudden I might lose my authority and their respect. Don't worry about that. I mean, don't fall all over yourself apologizing for everything, right? Apologizing for your apology being a bad apology. Don't, don't do that. We all know people who can go that far. But also, you need to be able to regularly repent to your children. Any of you perfect parents? If you are, I would love to know and love to know how you do it. I am certainly not a perfect parent. Um, this was highlighted yet again for me over this past week as Helene made its way through Columbia lost power. Our particular house had no power for five days. Five days without power with five kids. And then my nephew lived in Asheville, and so I went and got him and brought him back to Columbia. So we had eight people without power. I, I was a tad on the irritable side. And so it may have come out on my children a couple of times. And when it did, I had to go to them, and I had to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And my kids are like, Dad, it's fine. Like, I, we know you're tired. That's an explanation, it's not an excuse. I was still less than the dad I was called to be. I'm sorry, I will try harder tomorrow to be a better father. Forgive me. Right? And guess what? It doesn't destroy me to say that. Because I know I'm a sinner. And I know the beauty of God's grace. This truth that there is a problem in the world and that it's sin helps them understand why the world is the way that it is why are there terrible things like hurricanes and robbers and murderers sin some of that's natural evil right like there's no body there's no evil mastermind in africa doing something to create hurricanes no, that's the result of our sin, and we live in a fallen world. Now nature is at odds with us. Okay, no, no one has moral culpability for that evil. But then there are people who do things that are evil, like murder, 
and theft. People will bully. And so it helps them to have a grid for their world when you rightly repent to them and show them, hey, evil happens even in here. I'm not perfect. The world's not perfect. You're not perfect either. And you lead them in repentance, in confession. Okay. Next component, truth. We are saved by grace. Let's just talk for a second about what is grace. A couple of more common definitions. Grace is unmerited favor. Have you ever heard of that de definition before? That comes from Augustine or Augustine. Um, one of my favorites, grace is demerited favor. Meredith Klein, right? So it's not even that we were neutral. This is the truth of Romans 5. Christ died for us while we were what? His enemies, not his friends. We weren't Swiss. We weren't neutral. No, no, we were actively against him when he died for us, okay? So I like that um, definition, demerited favor. Sinclair Ferguson, what? former senior minister at Columbia, um, says that grace isn't a commodity. It's a person. It's Jesus. When tomorrow, if you worship here and we do the Lord's Supper, what you're getting is a means of grace because you are getting a means of communion with Christ. Christ is grace. And then, of course, Paul, that grace is mysterious and not to be presumed upon. We don't, we don't always completely understand grace, why he should pick you or me and not someone else. He does it for his own reasons. It's not illogical. It's not random. It's just beyond our ability to figure out. He and his logic and mind are infinite. Ours is finite. He chooses whom he chooses. Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. And if you're a recipient of grace, you use that grace to fight sin. Should I sin that grace may abound? Let it not be so. Absolutely not, is what Paul is saying. Instead, you use that grace in order that you should sin less. Again, how do we communicate that to our kids? I, I, I try to think about kind of a, um, a, a system or a way I can communicate this to my children when we talk about what it is to live under grace. And oftentimes, I'll break it into these five components. I'll say we're striving for perfection. Striving for perfection. It, it's, it's what Christ calls us to. It's what the Ten Commandments call us to. It's what the moral law calls us to. Right? So we want to strive for it. We don't want to just rest on our laurels. We're looking for progress. Are we getting better? Now, don't take the day by day, because yesterday may have been better than today. And this week may have been a really bad week. The Helene week was a bad week for Josh's personal sanctification. Okay? And if you're trying to put that in contest with the week before when I had power and the week now that I've got power back, Looks like I was a huge backslider because I was smelly and tired and had no power. Instead, you want to take the six-month view, the one-year view, the five-year view. Am I looking more like Christ than what I did before? And your children should see that. We celebrate our successes. We learn from our failures. And in all of it, we rest on God's grace. Okay? So it's, it's, the, it's the striving. It's looking. It's celebrating. It's learning. And yet it's ultimately resting. The world will tell your children that they cannot rest. Or 
that they should be able to rest all the time in the wrong thing. And so watching you actually rest in grace is a beautiful gift to your children. Doesn't undo me when I'm a failure. But I don't celebrate it either. Lastly, our children are saved by grace too. I had a seminary professor say, and he was so right, that uh, Presbyterian parents were Calvinists for ourselves and were Arminian for our children. If you don't know what that means, Arminians believe that you are responsible for your salvation. You make the choice. And so we want to be responsible for our children's salvation. We want to think that there's a way that we can parent them enough that they will be saved. We're okay with God's sovereignty in our own life, but I want to be sovereign over my kid's life. Right? And so there's a sense in which you need to deeply, down to your core, recognize you can't save your children. You are responsible to them to be a loving, godly parent. You are not responsible for their salvation that's god and the holy spirit does that distinction make sense okay all right i'm already way over time let's get to that last one real quick last component truth we are not saved by good works but we are saved to them this is our purpose it goes back to that first component truth where we look at god's word and god's word tells us what it is that we were meant for we can't decide what's good or bad. We have to lean on God and his authority for what is good and bad. Again, when we want to intersect this truth for our kids with the world in which they live, and it's something like, well, Dad, I mean, these two same-sex friends of mine say they love each other. And they want to be in a romantic relationship. They're not hurting anybody. Why can't these two friends be in a relationship? Why can't they date each other? Like, I want to date somebody the opposite. That doesn't make sense to me. Right? They, they, they enjoy it. Their parents are okay with it. Okay. Who tells us how we're designed? God and his word. Let's run back there and say, this, we are designed for good works, which God gives to us. So what are we going to do? We're going to speak to them the truth in love. We're going to be kind to them. We're going to love them well. We're going to invite them to church. We're going to invite them over to have meals with us at our table. And when they don't understand why we might believe something different than they do, we're going to invite them to know the truth that we know about Christ, his word, and who he is. Good works are usually the expressions of love. That's Paul's entire point in 1 Timothy 1.5. You get a little peek in 1 Timothy 1.5. Uh, Paul in Timothy is writing to a young pastor, his protege, right? And so he's doing his, his, what he always does. Hey, Timothy, writing to you, love you, good to talk to you you know, like you and I would do as, as we start a conversation. And then in the middle of it, it's like he can't even help himself. He says, this is the aim of our charge. You are getting a look at the playbook of ministry. He says, this is the goal of all ministry. What is it? Love. That issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. That's, that's the point of all ministry. That's the purpose of, for which you and I are called, is to love. And that love always goes in two directions. Love of God and love of neighbor. Not love of self. That seems to happen on its own just fine. And when you, we've got a two-year-old or a one-year-old, three-year-old, you see that on grand display all the time. They have trouble sharing their toys. They think all the world revolves around them. And it's hard for them. It's fine. But our job is to help them to love the Lord and to love their neighbor more, not to love self more. Again, how do we do that? We show it in our lives. How do you see me loving God more each day? How do you see me loving my neighbors more each day? 
as C.S. Lewis would say or describe, it's not thinking less of ourselves, it's thinking of ourselves less. And that should have a real palpable, tangible effect in the way we relate to all the people around us. Um, again, just going back to Helene for a second, uh, we, you know, storm came through, I got the boys and said, let's go start walking around the neighborhood. We've got a number of elderly people in our neighborhood, and if they're out cleaning their yard, we're going to help them, right? And so for an afternoon, we just went around helping people. Did the boys love it? No. I mean, again, we didn't have power, so there was no way to cool down afterwards, right? Why did we do it? Because we love our neighbor, right? And that's what I told them. I don't do this because I love bending over and picking up a whole bunch of pine cones, right? It's because that 80-year-old widow right there shouldn't be doing that, and we should do it. And when we do it for her, she sees and experiences something of the love of Christ as we love our neighbors. And there's no better reward than that. 